safety um, is, is really hard to pin down in terms of an easy sentence. Um, and I've been lucky enough to um, spend a lot of time looking at this. So um, have kind of built up what I hope will help you understand what is quite a complicated thing. We can really think of it is as a sign that it's safe to take personal risks. In the same way that we look at physical safety, is this something safe for me to get involved in or not? Psychological safety is the same concept. Looking from the outside in, is this safe for me to engage with or not? We can think it's safe to have difficult conversations. We can think it's safe to engage with people and give some of ourselves and leave ourselves feeling vulnerable. It's quite different to trust in that trust is about a one-to-one -one relationship. And we also build a concept of trust in about seven seconds. So within seven seconds of meeting somebody, you instantly get a feeling, do I like that person? Do I trust that person? And very rarely do we move away from our initial feeling. Psychological safety, a trust is a part of it, but it's the dynamics of all those relationships, as well as a few other things as well that we're going to unpick. So why is it important? What impact can it have? A research team wanted to look at the relationship between errors and psychological safety. What causes us to make more or less errors? They used hospitals as an example, and what they found was when you talked about the chance that an error could happen, when we allow ourselves the possibility of getting it wrong within appropriate boundaries, actually we make much less mistakes than when we pretend that there could never be an error or we make it so important that we don't make errors. Now let's think about that in the classroom. How often, perhaps around exams or perhaps around when people are doing things under assessment, do we say it's really important that we get it right, you know, we can have no space for errors. And what we know is the more that we say those things, the more likely people are to make errors. You can probably see this in yourself, perhaps when you're um, giving lessons all of the time and you can do that lesson time in, time out really well but the one time you're being observed or someone's watching you, or the one time somebody else comes into the room, you suddenly forget what you're going to do and suddenly you do things um, in a way that you wouldn't in another way. So what we know is enabling people to open the possibility that you might get it wrong actually reduces the likelihood that they will get it wrong. We also wanted to look at what psychological safety does in terms of high performance, performing at our very best. We use Google to look at all of different teams because Google is a big complex organization. And we looked at all the different factors that could lead to a high performing team. Was it that they had more resources? Was it the skill set of the team? Was it the size of the team? Was it where they were based? Was it how they interacted with each other? And what we found was that how the team worked together was far more important in terms of driving high performance than any of those other factors. Think about that in your school for a second. When you're getting a new person into your team, whether it's your you know, subject team or your leadership team or whatever it is for you, how often do we spend time thinking about the skill set they have and the experience they have? And that's really important but how little do we spend time thinking about how will people work together and how do we make sure we set up that arrangement so that people are really able to build safety? Because when we build psychological safety, people perform much better than when we don't. So what are those elements of psychological safety that I talked about? You can see some of them here. The first is role modeling behavior. So if you're not role modeling psychological safety, you're telling all of the students around you that it's not safe. You probably can imagine that in a setting in a staff briefing, for example. How many times have you sat in a staff briefing and the atmosphere, no matter what's being said, the atmosphere feels tense? 
How many times have you sat in a staff meeting where a senior leader says something and everybody in the room thinks that person doesn't believe what they've just said? That role modeling behavior, as humans, we pick up those signals really strongly. So if you're not feeling safe, the chances of your students feeling safe is very low. We've got those interpersonal dynamics that I talked about. How do people behave with each other? But that can be the past as well as the present. If, if somebody's had a really negative experience, and we see this with bullying all the time, um, when a student has had a history of being bullied, it's going to take them much, much longer to build friendships than a student who's never had that experience. We carry negative experiences with us, like bricks in our backpack. And it takes a long time to lose that weight and that view of unsafety. We have the ways that we do things that aren't written down. Think about your classroom. You've probably got the rules of how people engage, what the routine of coming into the classroom is, how people work together, that you probably haven't really talked about very much. But again, people pick up those signals very quickly and we just start doing things because that's what everybody does and that's the way we do things around here. If we don't intentionally create those rules, then we'll unintentionally create them and we can unintentionally build a lack of psychological safety into them and it's very hard to unpick. We also have not just the what, but the how. How we communicate together, how we interact with each other and I'm going to talk a bit more about that in the past. And of course, it's important to remember that school isn't just a bubble on its own. It's part of the wider society and therefore tensions and issues and experiences in wider society and the tone of wider society will absolutely influence your school and how you interact with each other as well. So as you can see, it's a really complicated model, but we're going to focus on the bits that we can absolutely control. So here you can see the components of psychological safety, the four key elements that we can really tangibly think about. The first is, is it safe to learn? And what we mean by that is twofold. The first is, is it safe to know that you don't know something and say that you don't know something? Or do you feel like you need to be expert in something? And the second is, is it safe to make mistakes and try but not be successful? The second element is, is it safe to challenge? Is it safe to disagree? Is it safe to have a different opinion? Is it safe to say that something isn't working for you? The third is, is it safe to engage and collaborate? Is it safe to really, um, really engage and really fully participate in something? And is it safe to collaborate? And we talk a lot about collaboration. We very rarely collaborate. We often cooperate. Cooperation is where we offer information when asked and when necessary. Collaboration is when we offer information freely at no gain to myself, but in order to make you feel better and you do better. So think about the staff room. If you hear someone talking about something and you know the answer or you've got experience, do you, do you give that information freely to make that person do well? Or is there a little voice inside your head saying, well, oh, if that person do, does really well, then that person might get the promotion that I want. So I'm just going to sit here and say nothing. And if they want to know, they'll ask me. And the last thing is being safe to be authentic, to bring who you are, what matters to you, and your ways of doing things to the table. Or are you trying to fit in to the ways of doing things, those unspoken rules that we just talked about? Now, I want to get a sense of this for you. So I'm going to launch a poll for you now. If you've not used polls before, you simply click on the screen when the poll is launched. And there's two questions for this. If you're using technology that doesn't use a poll, you can either put your question answers in the chat or you can just think about it for yourself. It's absolutely fine. So the questions I want you to answer is, which ones of these do you feel, you personally? This is completely anonymous, so nobody will see the answers. Um, do you feel safe to learn, safe to not know something and safe to make mistakes? Do you feel safe to challenge? Do you feel safe to be authentic? And do you feel safe to collaborate? Do you feel all of those or perhaps none of those? 
or perhaps you aren't sure. And the second question, if you scroll down further, is what do you think your students feel? I can see you're voting quickly, which is brilliant. I'm sure you're all very used to polls by now. I appreciate some schools don't use Zoom, so it might be quite different. Okay, excellent. I'll give you just a couple more seconds to vote. Okay, brilliant, here we go. I will end the poll now and share the results with you. So you can see that nearly half of you feel all of those things and that's brilliant. Um, but there are some things that people feel slightly less than others and some people feel none of those things. When we go to students, you can see that um, you think much less that the students feel all of these things. Students feel safe to learn um, in the majority, but some of those other things particularly less, including particularly safe to be authentic. And some of that will be about their age when you're very young and particularly during your teenage years, fitting and, um, and behaving in a certain way is very important. Um, but we'll unpick some of that in a second. So how do we tell psychological safety? The first rule of psychological safety, if you've watched the film Fight Club, is to never talk about psychological safety. Because if I don't feel safe and you ask me if I feel safe, I'm not going to feel safe to tell you the answer. So I'm going to say yes. So we have to look for it in different ways. And we can look for it on an individual level, on a team level and in terms of how people interact. And we're gonna unpick all of those. Firstly, on an individual level. This is called impression management, and it's the biggest sign of a lack of psychological safety. It's when what people think about us becomes more important than our ability to participate. Think of the time you've been in a meeting and everyone's talking and you have a question. Do you ask that question? Or does that voice inside your head say, nobody else is asking that question. I should probably know the answer. Maybe I wasn't really listening. So maybe they've said it already. What if everyone thinks that's a really stupid question? I'll just sit here and say nothing. That's impression management. And that's the sign of low psychological safety. What you normally find is when you do ask the question, at least five other people in the room think, have that look of, oh, I'm really glad somebody asked that question because they were also suffering from impression management. Where there is low psychological safety, impression management is very strong. You see it individually. You also see it in groups. How many times have you left a conversation, perhaps a staff briefing, and everyone nods and thinks that, yes, yes, great idea. And then they leave the staff room and say, well, that's not going to work, is it? But nobody was felt safe enough to have that conversation in the room. So we can see it in a couple of ways. The first is we don't ask questions because we don't want people to think that we should already know the answer or we're ignorant. Sometimes we don't want to admit our mistakes or weaknesses. How many times have you been in a conversation where you don't know what people are talking about or you can't do what people are saying? but you just nod and carry on and pretend that you understand because we don't want people to think that we're incompetent. Sometimes we don't offer up ideas because we don't want people to think that we've got ideas that other people don't have, or perhaps there's more senior people in the room who probably thought of that already. Even though your idea could be brilliant, you hold it back for fear of other people judging you. And sometimes we don't criticize or say something's not working because we don't want to appear the negative person. So you can think about this in terms of you and your students and see how often you see this behavior brought out. It's a sign of low psychological safety. The next thing we can see is covering. Now covering means that we hide bits of ourselves or change how we naturally do things in order to fit. You perhaps see it when people change the way that they speak, when they change how they would do things. It can be external or internal. For example, I would say schools are a very extrovert environment. 
How many times do you hear people say, that student's brilliant, but they should speak up more in class? Speaking up is an extrovert behavior. So if you're an introvert, that's very hard to do. And actually, why would we want people to behave in a way that isn't their natural way of communicating? So you see people trying to do things that isn't their natural style in order to do what they think is wanted of them. They also hide things about themselves, whether it's cultural, perhaps you see people start to dress differently or to behave in a different way that isn't their culturally authentic way because they don't want to draw attention to something that makes them different. And you also get what we call the fine mentality, where the answer to any question is fine. How are you feeling today? Oh, fine. How are you feeling about that piece of work? Oh, fine. Fine means feelings I'm not expressing. So when people say the word fine, you need to get to what's underneath that and also think about why have they felt the need to put up what we call a blocker, a simple superficial answer that ends the conversation, but there's something else behind it. Fine is a really damaging word. It just brushes over the conversation. So when you find yourself saying fine, think about what it is you really wanted to say and why you didn't say it. And if you find yourself hearing the word, if you find your students saying the word fine, ask a few more questions. What does fine look like for you? How does fine feel on a scale of one to 10? If you had to draw a picture of fine, what would it look like for you? Those kind of questions um, that can really draw out people. So now we can start to look at team dynamics. How do people interact with each other? How do your kids interact in the classroom with you or with each other also as a sign of psychological safety? So in a psychological safe environment, people are really comfortable admitting mistakes. In fact, they want to tell you when they've done something wrong because doing something wrong is a, is a route to getting it right and you will support and praise when they've got it right. When there is something that goes really wrong, either in team relationships, in people relationships, or something's gone really badly, in a safe environment, people want to talk about it. They want to understand how, they want to unpick it, but not blaming each other in a way of really looking at the thing rather than the people. Because again, when, it, when you feel safe, you want to learn from that situation, you feel safe to be vulnerable, and therefore we all want to discuss it so that we can share with each other. When we're in a safe environment, people will share information openly. So you find there's much more building of ideas, shaping of things together, starting of sentences that don't we know aren't perfect, but start the conversation going. And because of that, we get better decision making and better learning. Now let's compare that to a psychologically less safe environment. In that environment, people are frightened of admitting mistakes. When there has been a mistake, they'll either try and cover it up, they'll try and get to the right result before you see the mistake, or they'll try and blame other things for it. They won't take ownership of that mistake, they will try and blame other reasons why they got it wrong that wasn't their fault. In that dynamic where something goes wrong, people will be quick to look at whose fault it is. People hold on to information in a psychologically unsafe environment because information is power. So we hold on to information and if I know something, I'm not gonna tell you unless there's a power reason why I want to bring you into my circle and I'll tell you with a lens of, I know something that you don't know. And because of that lack of safety and that lack of honest conversation, we get what we call the common knowledge effect where lots of assumptions are made. We just keep doing things the way we've always done them. And we make lots of assumptions until something really bad happens and then we look back to why. So again, you can think about your staff room, your class, whatever works for you and start to look for those signs and start to think about what's that telling me about how people are feeling. Let's understand how people choose whether to interact or not. So this has been a um, this has been a really long method.
that we've known for a long time, but we've only really looked at it at physical safety before. So we know, for example, children learn very early to stay away from things that are hot and to go towards people who are very safe. But what we know now is that people actually do exactly the same with how much do I give of myself? How much do I participate? How much do I stay on the periphery of something? So the SCARF model means there's five elements that make us decide whether the risk is high or the reward is high. And if the reward is likely to be higher, um, then we're gonna go towards something. And if the risk is higher, then we're gonna stay away from something. It's called SCARF because of the five elements all start with the letters S-C-A-R-F. So the five elements are first status. Do I feel like I belong? in this environment? Do I feel like I have worth? And am I very clear what my skill set is and what my role therefore is? The second is certainty. Do I know how people are going to react to something? Am I a student in your class who knows roughly how you're going to respond to different situations with a level of predictability? Or do I feel like some days I'm going to have Fabrizio is a teacher and he's a brilliant teacher and really engaging and really warm and welcoming and wants me to engage. And then some days he's really cold and critical of me and I don't know which Fabrizio I'm going to get when I walk into that classroom. As humans, we really need certainty and that lack of certainty is very disrupting to us. The A is autonomy. Can I bring my style? Am I told how to do everything in absolute detail? Or am I given boundaries and then I'm able to do things in my own way? The more we can do things in our own way, the safer we will always feel. The R is relatedness. Do I have a connection? Even if we disagree, even if we have tough conversations, do I have a connection with you? And the F is fairness. Do I feel like I'm treated the same way as other people? If I do something wrong, do I feel like the punishment that I am going to get is, will be similar to the as punishment another person will get? Or in my class or in my staff room, do I feel like there are some people who can do no wrong and there are other people who always seem to be in trouble and get much harsher punishments? My perception, much more than reality. Like I said before, if those things are positive, people will engage. If those things are, are, are less positive, people will stand on the outside. It doesn't mean that they're not there. It doesn't mean they're not attending school. It doesn't mean they're not sat in your classroom. It means they're just holding back. They're watching in the same way that if you were stood at the side of a swimming pool and you weren't sure if you could swim, you wouldn't jump right in. You to hold back, you wait, you dip your toe in the water. It's exactly the same on a psychological level. We can also see, particularly when that relatedness function, that connection is missing, we see a change in behavior in people. Here are some of the elements you commonly see and they're a change in behavior. So the first is you see a reduction in intelligent thought and reasoning. So you meet, see a move away from responding to things to reacting to things. Think about perhaps a person in your staff room who's normally quite calm and collected and will really think through their responses and suddenly they become quite reactive and quite emotional in how they respond and quite kind of dramatic in how they respond. That will be a change in psychological safety. We also start to see impaired self-regulation. So increased frustration, increased inability to kind of confine yourself to behaviors. You'll see fidgeting, you'll see um, inability to kind of control your thoughts. And you'll also see often things like um, an outburst of something or hanging on to an idea and not being able to let that idea go. We see increased self-defeating behavior. And this can come in two ways. It can come in a change in actual behavior. So perhaps a super organized child is suddenly finding that they're procrastinating and they're not putting work in and they're not doing the things that they would normally do, but there's no apparent reason for why. They just seem to be stuck. We also see it in a change of language. So perhaps the student who confidently asks ideas 
suddenly start saying, this is probably a silly idea, but this is what I think, but it's probably just me, literally physically distancing themselves from the idea in order to make it safer. We see increased defensiveness. So because you feel unsafe, everything's like a threat. In the same way that you watch perhaps a horror movie, and even though you know it's not real, after you've watched a horror movie, you listen for every sound, every noise becomes suddenly potential to be something else. It's the same in our brain for psychological safety. If you feel unsafe, everything becomes a judgment. Everything becomes a criticism. So perhaps you asking that student, did you manage to get the work done? Becomes a judgment that you don't believe that they did get it done. And so they're going to defend themselves and they're going to attack rather than see it as a question. If these continue for any length of time, we see a reduced pro-social behavior. So we see people literally take themselves to the outside of a social circle or a friendship circle and really start to withdraw. And because our brains don't know the difference between psychological safety and physical safety, any time that this goes on for any length of time, our bodies respond in the same way they would if they were if you were physically unsafe. So you start to not sleep, you start to not eat, your, your body is, is flooded with the, the hormone that we call cortisol, which is a stress hormone, which increases your heart rate, increases your temperature, increases your state of alert. And of course, you can see the damage that will do to people's ability to really engage and participate and do well. So I want to get a view from you now, how many of these you can see. When you're thinking about yourself or your students, whichever works for these, which ones of these do you recognize? The shift in behavior. I know for me, there are certainly increased defensiveness is one I really recognize in myself. Those days where everything feels like people are judging you. And that for me is a sign that there's something missing in my psychological safety. But what about for you? What do you see? Excellent, I can see you voting quickly, brilliant. Okay, I'll give you just a couple more seconds. If you're a reflective thinker, you can absolutely just think about it. You don't need to vote. Okay. There we go. I will share the results. You can see lots of them. So hopefully you've seen them all and different people will respond in different ways. But it, defensiveness seems to be a very common one. And that's what psychology would tell us as well. So we can use this to our knowledge. When you see these behaviours, whether it's in fellow staff or in students or in parents, those emails that we get from parents that are out of all proportion of what we're, of what we're talking about, rather than say to ourselves, why is that student acting strangely? Why is that parent being really annoying? Why is that staff member suddenly starting acting really strangely? We can flip that conversation in ourselves and say, what is it about the environment that means their psychological safety has changed? And how can I build their psychological safety again? Make it less about the person and more about how you can change that for them. So here are some of the things we can do to support psychological safety. These are the behaviors that generally support psychological safety, but you'll see that at the moment, some of them are quite hard to achieve. Physical proximity, physical contact, you know, those can be really hard at the moment. So it means we need to amplify the others. So you can see things like short energetic exchanges. Don't sit your students down for hour long meetings and expect them to feel safe. Dip in, dip out, what we call cluster, conversations are the best way of getting psychological safety and engagement. Give them something, talk to them for 20 minutes, let them go away and do something, let them come back, let them go away, let them come back. That will maximize engagement and psychological safety. Building in small courtesies, thank you. I really appreciate how you did that. 
again, building that sense of status. I love that in this group, in this class, you do this will really help them. <coughs> Excuse me. Making sure you're not interrupting. Um, quite hard to do on remote learning, um, but there are lots of things you can do to help that. And making sure that you're maintaining eye contact and you're really listening to what they're saying and not just listening to the words, but also listening to what they're not saying, their body language, how they're behaving. That's really important. Particularly with teenagers, one of the things that we know from psychology is the space to look away and do something else whilst talking about things is really important. Often as adults, we have that view that students have to be engaged with us all the time and they have to be looking at us. And if I want to have a difficult conversation with a student, I want them to look at me in the face and I want them to be very concentrating. Teenage brains don't work like that. You will get a better conversation if you allow them to look away and you allow them to fiddle with things or do something else whilst talking with them, particularly about emotionally difficult things. Here are some things you can tangibly do alongside these things. The first is make sure you're framing things realistically. Focus on the input that people are putting in, not the outcome. So don't focus on how well they did in the exam. Of course, mention it, but also focus on the effort that they put into it and praise that and not just the outcome. The more we focus on the outcome, and parents, of course, do this all the time. Where did you come? What number did you come in the class? All of those things the less likely we make it safe for people to make errors. And remember what we said at the start, the more pressure there is on you to make an error, the less likely you are going to do well. Make sure that you're giving activity and events perspective. We tend to talk about every piece of work, every exam, every activity that we're doing as the most important thing in the world. I've heard many parents say things to students like, these exams will shape your future forever. The pressure we're putting on people is huge and they're much more likely to lose psychological safety and therefore much more likely to do less well. So yes, they're important, but wherever you go from here, we can do something with it. So just try your best. Recognize, particularly at the moment, there's uncertainty and be vulnerable about that. Recognize that you're feeling uncertainty too and articulate that to your students. That shared vulnerability and the chance of opening up errors will make it much safer for them. You also can admit your failings. Ask for help for things. When you're designing something or you're, ask, you're designing a class, actually ask the students what they want. Co-design things with them, ask them to engage, ask them if you've missed something out of a conversation, open up permission for them to engage and challenge you is a really positive sign. When they do do that, make sure you respond to it positively. Often when people don't tell us what we want to hear, we dismiss them. We listen for what we're going to say, it's called automated listening. When we're hearing the first six seconds of a conversation and then we're already in our head deciding how we're gonna answer or how we're gonna dismiss their idea or how we're gonna tell them what they, why they can't do what they want to do and we've missed the conversation. Recognize when students, particularly students, given the power dynamic in a classroom, when students challenge you or offer you feedback or ask for something else or tell you that they don't understand things, even though it's frustrating and might be annoying because you want to get on, it's really a good sign. It shows psychological safety and it shows courage. So make sure you're celebrating that. Even if you, they don't get to do what they want to do or you're not going to take up the idea, embrace the messenger and encourage that kind of participation. When we have difficult conversations comfortably, that's when we build real psychological safety. So don't look for comfort, look for discomfort in a safe environment. You can also think about how you build that into your classroom in their interactions with each other as well as with you. Here are three key elements that you can do. Make sure that we're replacing curious, um, criticism with curiosity. When somebody gives an idea, rather than encouraging students to judge that idea or to comment on that idea, encourage them to come with that with curiosity. 
How did that student get to that place? What was it that led them to have that opinion? Not judging it, saying it's right or wrong, but coming with curiosity makes people feel a lot safer and widens everybody's learning. Encourage yourself and your students to talk about when they're not at their best. We never perform at our best 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So when you've had a day where you really wasn't into it, or you were really grumpy because you were tired or you were hungry, admit that to your students and encourage them to do the same with each other. I really wasn't listening to you when you had that conversation because I was grumpy. I was a bit distracted, so I really didn't take account of what you said. Those little conversations really build psychological safety. We can also create an informal feed forward system. What I mean by that is we often have a formal end of year school report type system and we're feeding back. We're looking at what's gone back and we're judging it. Instead, you get much better engagement when you feed forward rather than saying what something was and the person can do nothing about what has happened. Talk to them about what would be better next time. Give them specific advice on what could be better next time. And do that all of the time with each other. After every lesson, what did we do great in this lesson? What could we do differently? What did you enjoy about this lesson? What would you like me to do differently next time? If we're encouraging that feedback loop, it really builds those trust and therefore builds psychological safety. How many times have you had to said to your students, what could I do differently? And everyone sits there like this. And no one says anything at all. That tells you there's low psychological safety. And the more we practice those skills, the more they'll engage in it and know it's safe. Because when you ask a question like that, what's going on in people's heads, probably in the same way as perhaps when the head asks you questions, is does that person really want to know the truth? What's going to happen if I say that? Or what will happen to our relationship? So they hold back that impression management that we talked about. Underpinning psychological safety is the four must, well-being must-haves. You must have positive relationships, meaningful relationships, not just transactional relationships. You're my teacher, I'm your student, that's it. Build connection, build moments that build human-to-human -human relationship. We must have a sense of purpose. We must be able to see why we're doing things, how it fits in, and how it fits in what matters to me. In order to know what, how to do that with your students, you need to know your students. You need to know what matters to them. And then you can frame conversations and link things in a way that have mattered to them. Similarly for you, you need to know that what you're doing, those reports you're writing, that system that you're doing, that paperwork that you're filling in, has something to do with what you joined teaching for. Otherwise, it's really hard to engage in it. We must be able to have a level of autonomy. So rather than tell people exactly how to do things, give them a set of boundaries and let them do it in their own way within those boundaries. Often, perhaps when we're dealing with other staff as well as the students, we have in our head what something should look like. And if it doesn't look exactly like that, it's not good enough. Enable people to do things in their way and see how they've achieved the outcome rather than the input you were expecting. And lastly, we need to see a sense of progress. So rather than just where were, was I in the class or how did I do in that test, recognize the things that people have already got to, even if there's a really long way to go. So maybe I'm rubbish at maths. In fact, I am rubbish at maths. But perhaps by the end of the first term, I've just got a little bit better. I'm still at the bottom of the class, but perhaps I've just started to do one or two things better Recognizing that sense of progress for ourselves as well as other people is really important rather than constantly looking at what's next and how much further have we got to go. There's a way of giving feedback in that feedback loop that takes out the emotion and makes it feel less um, personal and easier to give. So this is the simple model. I'm not going to talk about it too much. But tell people the specifics of where they were, where the interaction happened. Tell the person what they did rather than saying you're lazy or you're bossy or you're something, which is about a personal thing. Make it about the behavior. So Fabrizio, when we were talking yesterday and you banged your head, your hand on the table, 
So I'm giving him the very specific action that he did. I felt it was aggressive. So I'm not telling him it was aggressive because that's just going to get into a conversation. And we all have our own perception of what something is, particularly in an international sport, and on a cultural lens of what behaviour looks like. And you get into really difficult circumstances of what something is or isn't. And that's not a good conversation. So I felt it was aggressive. And so I'd love it if you could find a different way of getting my attention. It's not personal, it's not emotional. It's easier for me to give. It's about helping him be better rather than judging him. And I'm much more likely to get a positive response than a defense response because I haven't made it about him as a person. You can practice this and you can encourage your students to practice this with each other as well. And I just want to spend a couple of minutes talking about the current situation because psychological safety is very hard to achieve. You have to be much more intentional about it in challenging circumstances. And of course, the current climate, for many different reasons, is very challenging. So we're struggling with that physical distance. And I've talked already about how physical proximity and spending time with people can really build psychological safety. But we don't have that in many places around the world. We also, because of that, can lose what we call affinity distance. Affinity is a connection. Affinity is a sense of belonging, a sense of shared journey. And because people are remote, because we're all dispersed across lots of different circumstances, and because people's circumstances are different, we're all in the same storm, but we're in very different boats, our circumstances are very different, we can lose that sense of affinity. When we spend time apart from people, we also sometimes overthink every communication. So an email, we read tone into it. A, somebody turns their camera off in a, in a meeting and we read that they're not engaged when actually we don't really know what's going on for them at all. And lastly, importantly for young people who are very control based, particularly teenagers, there is so much at the moment that's out of people's control that it can lead to a real sense of uncertainty. And remember the staff model, certainty is very important to us in terms of engaging in something. So this means we need to be really intentional in how we build psychological safety. Here are some really thing, um, simple things we can do. Make sure you've got really clear communication channels. You know how you want people to communicate with you. You've got different ways of doing it. You're going to have time for formal lessons. You're going to have time for informal connection. And they know which is which. You want to make sure you're encouraging participation and active listening for everyone. Now, as a school, you may have a view about whether they have to have their cameras on, they have to have their cameras off. As, as a psychologist, I would tell you, let them do it in the way that works for them. But I appreciate that's more complicated in a school, but have that conversation. Don't just make a rule and, not, and then run it. Have the conversation about why you've got that rule. Having cameras on can be great because you can see people, it can also be really challenging for people who perhaps they're worried that their room isn't as nice as their other as the other students' room, or they're um, they've got more people in their family, or they're not feeling so great today, or perhaps they just find the constant eye to eye contact. We have something called Zoom fatigue, which means you have to try really hard in Zoom. So I would say encourage them to participate in their way and do things to check they're participating and draw them into the conversation rather than force a form of participation. You will have heard me say, vote in the polls, just reflect. Put something in the chat, come off mute. Give, giving people as many different ways to participate will enable most people to find their authentic way. Make sure when people ask questions or say that they're not doing so well, we're responding positively to that and we're really listening. We're responding positively and we're showing them the opportunities. So, for example, at the moment, there are huge opportunities for virtual connection. You can do museum tours that you would never be able to afford to go to. You can get in speakers that you would never be able to afford to travel. All of those things, there's great opportunities in remote learning. But make sure you're not being what we call toxically positive. You're simplifying things and you're being over positive to make things feel better and to fix things. A good example would be, I'm really struggling with lockdown. Oh, there's people in much worse situations than you. 
what you've done in that place is you've simplified the conversation. You've lost empathy because you're not listening to what the person's saying, but also you're devaluing their feelings. You're also telling them that's a silly feeling to have and you're silly for having that feeling. That can be really damaging to well-being. You can recognize the opportunities for students to grow in this situation. We hear a lot about people saying that students are falling behind. They're falling behind where we say they should be. And actually in the current circumstances, should we be changing where we think they should be? What they're learning is a real opportunity to do things differently. They're learning agility, which is a really important future skill. They're building resilience. They're finding solutions. They're great life skills. So try and shape things in a different way. And most importantly, don't make it just about education. Focus on that human to human affinity things. Those little things that you would naturally do in a classroom, perhaps celebrating birthdays, perhaps learning about people's pets, perhaps learning about people's homes. They are real opportunities to build human to human connection and not just focus on the work at hand. So I've given you hopefully lots of things to think about and I wanted to leave you with some top tips. Um, we will absolutely be um, sharing this with you so you don't need to remember it all, don't worry. And you don't need to do all of it. You can't go from here to here. You can make small incremental nudges um, and that will really help you. Try something, if it doesn't work, try it again. Adopt that psychological safety of willing to learn. So try something, get feedback. If it doesn't work, try something else. Every circumstance is different. I hope it's been helpful to you. I've given you lots to think about. I have left some time for questions. Um, so if you do have any questions, feel free to ask or any experiences you'd like to share as well, because I'm sure you can learn from each other as well. Lucia. Hello. Wow, <laughs> thank you very much, Claire. That was great. Uh, we had a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, I, um, or comments with 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 questions. Um, Richard, Richard, uh, up here. Uh, I'm struggling with this, but I'll be fine. Here. Sometimes uh, I find that on the online environment, children find convenient strategies to cover, such as saying that the internet is not working, or just total silence during the conversation or Q and A period, and. And this, uh, and Richard wonders how to draw them out. So I would say a couple of things. First of all, think about how you're engaging with them. You know, if they find, if you find that there's silence in Q&A, perhaps q and A's are quite scary for them, in which mm. case launch polls, get them to put things in the chat box, use things like Slido. I don't, maybe you're not allowed to use Slido in school, I'm not sure, but you know, Slido is where people can ask, um, or Menti or some of those other things is where people can ask questions anonymously so they're not having to have that impression management they can ask questions in different ways use whiteboards all of those things mm. that enable them to engage in slightly safer ways if you feel like students are covering a student is covering and saying you know my internet's not working all of those things have that honest conversation have just open the conversation up to say is there anything I can do to help? Is there something else going on that you'd like to tell me about? You have all of these skills. You, I'm sure you have brilliant pastoral skills and know what to do when stu students are struggling in lots of different ways. Translate it into, into this situation and I'm pretty sure you'll have the skills already. Fabrizio, mm -hmm. I see you have your hand up. Do you want to ask yes. something? Yes, uh, can you comment again on the... You mentioned something about uh, the constant repetition that, you know, right now what's happening in kids being unable to attend school at school that, you know, we keep repeating that they're falling behind. I think you have very strong opinions about that. Can you can you uh, talk about this again? Yeah, I think it's um, there, and it will be different in different countries, but in many countries, there is the rhetoric of if they're not physically in school, they're losing out if they're not, you know, if because they can't sit exams, there's, a, there's, you know, they're gonna be really lose out. They're falling behind in their studies. And, you know, I think we need to remember a couple of things. Every student in the world in this current situation is in a similar space. Of course there's degrees. And I think we should be more worried 
about the inequality that's that's growing between those students who have like your schools have great teachers and great great ability to access the internet and those things and those students who don't have those things i think that's where the falling out is but i think where students are still getting education and where students are still learning and it's really important we recognize the opportunities in this environment they're learning resilience they're learning empathy they're learning how to do things in a different way when we get to the future of work and if any of your students attend this attended the session last week or this week about the future of work you know actually agility and learning to be adaptable and take your skills and transfer them into different challenging situations is absolutely an important life skill so they're learning lots of different things if they're not learning the academic in a different in a way that we want them to so we need to stop and the more we talk to them about you're falling behind you're you know this is going to impact your life the more pressure we're putting on them and the less psychological safety they're going to have so recognize these challenges, recognizing they're not in the place that perhaps we expected them to be, but that doesn't mean they're failing. And I think that's really important. Because it's not about them. It's, it's not about anybody, no? It's the conditions that we are living in at the moment. Right, a few more comments. Um, Rosanna said that students love it when teachers praise the way they've done things. And also said that we need to, as teachers, to have empathy and, and build excellent rapport with, yeah. with our students. And empathy is, we talk about empathy a lot. There is a, we very rarely practice empathy. We normally practice sympathy. So yeah. empathy is listening without judgment, connecting to the emotion, even if it isn't the emotion that you would have in that circumstance and sitting with someone rather than trying to fix it. I think often teachers, with, with all the right reasons, they want to fix things, they want to find <laughs> solutions. Empathy is sitting with that situation and helping a student find their own solutions yeah. that isn't your solution and, and isn't based on what you think is the right thing. And that's that takes a lot of skill. Mm. Um, I'm, I missed the name, but the question, uh, Michael, how do we deal with students who are overachievers? Because the other students can make fun of them sometimes by calling them names. So I think there's two parts to this. The first is worry, work on why the other students are calling them names because they're overachievers. And often that will be about a lack of psychological safety. You, you know, they're seeing those students that are higher than them. Um, when we lose psychological safety, we live on like a seesaw. The only way for me to go up is to push this person down. So we've got to lose that seesaw effect. So we've got to work on those other students seeing their value as well, so that they're going up without pushing the other person down. With those particular students who are, are managing that, um, A, make sure, again, you're valuing how they're doing things, there's a really great tip. One of the things we can do, and I'm sure many of you do this already, those students that are doing well, get them to talk about how they got there, not how easy it is, not the answers to the questions. How did they get from the point where they didn't know something to the point where they're now quite confident in it and help and how they can help other students on that journey? We, we often kind of celebrate those people who do things easily and seamlessly. And we don't talk about how hard that journey was or the lessons they've learned along the way. So get them to, to work with the other students, but also get those other students who are finding it hard to articulate why they're finding it hard and work together to find solutions. And sometimes that will help. Yes. Patricia says that she feels that it's sometimes more parents that have the feeling so. The, student, the, the young ones falling behind. Yeah, absolutely. And we need to help the parents see that there's a path. And often when we feel insecure, and we all do this, right? When we feel insecure and uncertain, we cling on to something to hang our emotion on. So we want to be angry or we want to complain about something because we, we can't control so much in our lives. So try and make sure the parents have a sense of engagement they have a sense of 
co-designing what's going to happen next. Yeah. Um, and they also, they're understanding the skills that those students are learning. And they're also learning, because remember, this is a huge period of change and uncertainty for parents as well. I don't know if you, um, in the UK, we had a, we have a um, parents, big parents forum, millions of parents on it. It's called Mumsnet. And they studied recently the amount of swearing. Um, so, you know, offensive language that was on Mumsnet, and they found that there was an absolute direct correlation between when schools went into lockdown and the amount of swearing. <laughs> so, you know, recognize that actually this is a really challenging time for parents too. Maybe they're learning to appreciate some of the things you do a bit more. Mm, uh, yes, I'm sure they are. I'm sure they are. They're, they're, they are struggling a lot. Parents with children at, in school age and lockdown and everything. I think it's amazing. So uh, Claire, I, I don't know what to say. Again, thank you so much. It's, it's just one minute after 5.30 here in Argentina. So um, at one thing I loved from what you said today among many uh, is this, this fine acronym feelings I'm not expressing and, and, and I liked it and I could use it as well for myself. So on a scale of one to 10, how fine am I feeling when I say I'm fine? Um, very, very, uh, the scarf and, and other, other of the things. As I did yesterday, I showed you my notes. I take notes always, scribble here and there and I keep them eh? and I read them. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here today. We had about 100 people. Um, it was great to be able to offer you this, this uh, lovely, all these lovely nuggets of wisdom that, that Claire leaves with us. Um, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you a lot uh, to Fabricio, who worked very hard to put this together, although the teacher called on him. <laughs> Um, <laughs> have a lovely rest of the day everybody wherever you are and stay safe there we'll Bye. see you soon